Hi, I'm Vera Mays. I'm one of the learning specialists in the Learning Commons, and I also am one of the math instructors here at TCC. So today I'm going to be going through a series of questions that are aimed to help you prepare for the final exam. These are based on what's included in the final exam. Now I know some of you will be taking it pencil paper, some will be taking out a computer. So it may look a little bit different, but the integrity of the questions should stay the same. So um, I know we're gonna have more people joining us, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So here we go. All right, so we're gonna get started. And the first thing I wanna look at that you guys have studied a lot this semester is functions and lines. And this is also is something that if you're gonna carry over into college algebra is gonna be really important for you. All right, so one of the first things they ask you to do is evaluate a, a function at a specific point or at a specific X value. So when they give you something that looks like f of negative two, they're telling you everywhere in the function that you've been given, every x gets substituted with this negative two right here. So as you can see, every x, and I like to put them in parentheses just so I can kind of keep track of what I've done, and it makes the signs a little bit easier. And so as you go through this, the important thing is to make sure you're doing things in the right order. Um, we know that exponents come in the order of operations before multiplication. So you need to deal with the negative two to the third power first. Okay, come on. All right, so when you do that, you get a negative eight and then you take the negative eight times a negative two, turns it back positive. And then all we have to do is simplify and add all the numbers and we get a value of 17. All right, any questions on this one? Okay, feel free to ask questions. And Eric, since you don't have your name on your uh, picture, can you go ahead and put your name in the chat, please, for the records? All right, so next one right. dealing with functions is asking you, is this set a function? And you guys have dealt with this a lot of different ways. You've drawn pictures, you've looked at relationships. Um, so there really is no one right way to do it, but we do know that if it's a function, each X value should only be paired with one unique Y value. So one of the ways um, we can look at it is kind of put it in a chart, like a T table. And you could see here, two is paired with seven, but two is also paired with one. So some people like to look at it this way. Some people like to draw the points you've given, if it's a, a little set, draw the points real quickly and then look to see if it violates that vertical line test. And so you can see here, we've got two points, that two one and that two seven that violate that vertical line test. So this one is not a function. Something else they like to ask you with these functions or with these group of points is identify the domain. And so the domain is all your X values. So all you have to do is go through and list them without repeating anything. So in this one, I can see a two, a negative three. I'm gonna skip this two because I already have a two and then three. And then they also like to ask you the range Thank you, Eric. And so the range is just your Y values. So you don't have to do anything. You just go through and look at them. But you can see in this case, one of the Y values is repeated. So you don't list it twice. You just list each one of them one time. All right, so before we go to the next questions, any comments or questions on this one? If you can just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Give me a couple of minutes. I'm trying to write out what you, Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but all three of the ways of thinking about this are fine to determine if something is a function. If you can just look at it and say yes or no, or if you like to do the chart, or if you like to draw the picture. I think picture is better. Let me just do a picture. Mm -hmm. It's very visual, isn't it? Yeah. 
And if the, the functions they give you are not going to be huge functions, so it's not going to take you long to graph, you know, four or five points and see if they, they line up like this one did. Okay, we're ready? Yes. Okay. All mm -hmm. right, so the next thing about domain they asked you to do was when you were given a rational function. So we mm -hmm. know with fractions, there's one thing we're taught until you get to calculus, we are not allowed to divide by zero. So one of the things we can do to find our domain, our limits on our domain, is just to set the bottom equal to zero. <clears throat> and then it becomes not a crazy problem. It's a very simple one. Usually sometimes you have to factor, but in this case you didn't. You just set it equal to zero, solve it, and get the x by itself. And when you solved it, it said x was equal to one third, but because this is where we set our bottom equal to zero, that's the one number we are not allowed to use. So because I'm very visual, I like to think about it in terms of a number line. So here's that one third. So this says every number is in our domain except for the one that made the bottom go to zero. Now, you have to be very careful on a test. How do they want this answer? This one, the question said, do it in set builder. So set builder is that really formal way of notating. It has the braces on the end and it has the X with the bar. Then you put your answer and then you close it with a brace. Now, because there was only one condition on this domain that X not be equal to one third, that's all we have to set in our braces. So keep in mind, there's only two things that we know that limit our domain. If it's a fraction or if it's a square root, fourth root, an even index type radical, those are the only two things. Any other function is not gonna have a limited domain. Okay, any questions on this one? Welcome back, Robert. Good to see you. How are you? All right, so is this no pit, no points were given, no gra no no function was actually given to you. This is typical where they might just say, is this a function? And they're looking for just yes or no. How would we tell? What tool do we have that we could easily use on a graph? Vertical line test. Very good. So anywhere I stick a vertical line, does it pass or fail? It only hit one time there. I'm gonna stick one over here. Only hit the graph one time. There's no place that I can move these vertical lines that would hit more than once. So this one is definitely a function. So they ask us, they'll give us, with functions, they give these things to us so many different ways. The first one we did, we evaluated f of negative two, but we had the actual function. We had the, the numbers and the letters. This one, somebody has already drawn it for us. And all we have to do is look at the graph to find out. So remember, I said, if it's in the parentheses, they're giving us the X value and they want us to give them the Y value. So what do you guys think on this one? When X is negative two, what is Y? Negative three. Good. So you're going to go down from where the X was negative two to the point, any point on that line is right there. And then you're going to go over to the Y value and you can see that it comes out at a negative three value. This one is a favorite on the test. You probably saw it on your actual module unit test. We like it because there's not much for you to do, but you really have to understand. I'm giving you the X, you need to give me the Y value. Okay. Any questions on that one? Okay, let's go on. So another thing you guys have spent a lot of time this semester, and it will come in, whoops, come in very handy when you, if you go to college algebra, is talking about lines and Lines have two things that are very special to them. They all have a slope and they all have a y-intercept. Kind of like most people 
in our culture have a first name and a last name, two things that identify them. Lines have two things that identify them also. So you've learned to look at graphs. You've learned to use a formula. So one of the things I like to do is when I'm doing these, because I'm probably going to use the formula on this versus graphing it, then that's going to take me a little bit too much time. Label your points. The formula has some X1s and Y1s and X2s and Y2s. And it doesn't matter which point you say is the first one, which is the second, as long as you're very consistent. The first X point is X1. The second X point would be our X2. And then you do have to know the slope formula. And then it's really important that we put these in and we be very careful with the signs. They do like to do a double negative. I've seen them trick people that way a lot on the form, the final. So plug each one in. And because you've labeled them, you don't have to think as hard about where they go. So substitute the values and then just clean up. Clean up the top, clean up the bottom. And in this case, I ended up with zero on top. And that's something else they like to do because most people struggle to remember, is it okay to have the zero on top or is it okay to have the zero on bottom? So if you're not sure, just plug this into your calculator. You're either gonna get a value of zero or you're gonna get an error. And we're gonna talk about both kind of lines today. So this one has a zero slope. Can anybody tell me what kind of line this would be? The horizontal line. Very good, very good. Oh, I put the wrong thing on here. <laughs> yeah, horizontal line, sorry. Okay, now this one didn't give me points, didn't give me the picture. Sorry, my phone's ringing here. It's a spam caller, so I don't need to take that. So one of the best ways we can do this type is if we get it back into the equation y equals mx plus b. So if I can play with this a little bit and get the y by itself, I'll be able to just look at it and grab the slope. So looking at this, I wanna isolate the y term. So I'm gonna subtract this five x from both sides. It'll cancel out and leave me with just a three y. And then to get the y by itself, all I have to do is divide everybody by three and then, of course, cancel wherever it cancels. And now, because it's y equals mx plus b, let me see if I can write this on here. If you look at it, y equals mx plus b, you can see directly above the m is the slope. And that way it helps identify it. All right, any questions on this one? So we've seen it, we'll see it three ways. One, they'll give us the points. Two, they'll give us an equation like this and we need to manipulate it a little bit. Or three, they'll give it to us as a graph. Okay, so now this one, you guys know two ways to graph a line. Before this class, you probably learned to use a T-table. You know, do a good X, Y, T-table, plug in some numbers to your function, and then graph it. So I'm gonna do it both ways. I'm gonna do it the original way with a T-table where I pick three values for X, plug them in and get their Y values and then graph those points and then connect the dots. I'm gonna also do it the shorter way that you learned in this class using the slope and the intercept. So when you look at this y equals, and again, you can compare it to y equals mx plus b. So you can see the slope is a negative two and the b is a one. So I always like to write my slope as a fraction since one of the ways that you've identified slope is rise over run. That way you can always put any number over one and it's not gonna change it. All right, so we start by graphing the B, that's the base. That's where it hits the Y axis. In this case, that would be when Y is one. And then we're gonna use our slope to walk 
to the next point. And remember, it's negative two over run, which is rise over run. And I usually like to do my run first and then my rise either way. And since this is negative, I'm gonna let the top be the negative one. So that means instead of going up, I'm gonna go down. So from the point I started with, I'm gonna go over one, and then I'm gonna go down two, and I will get my next point. And then I will connect the dots. So you can see I ended up with the exact same line. When I'm on a test situation, I wanna find the thing I'm comfortable with but also takes the shortest amount of time. Some of you are still the most comfortable with doing a T-table, plugging points in. It takes a little bit longer, but if that's your comfort zone, do it that way. All right, questions on this one? Everybody okay? All right. So now we've talked about the slope. We've talked about the y equals mx plus b. The other formula that you would have seen is called the point slope formula. This is one version. You might have seen y minus y1 equals mx minus x1, or your teacher may have given it to you in this format. However you learned it is fine. And this one is asking, to write the slope intercept form of the equation for the line that passes through these two points. So I am not given the slope. So I need to go ahead and start by calculating the slope. So I'm gonna use my two points. I, again, I like to label x1, y1, x2, y2. And then when I go to plug them in, it helps me keep everything lined up and straight now, this is one of those cases where, remember, I talked about they like to throw in double negatives just to see if you're paying attention. So when I simplify this, the top, they're both negative, so I add them and keep their sign. On the bottom, it's going to change it to a positive, so we can see our slope ends up being a negative 14 over 3. And now we need to find the B. So we're going to use one of the points and the slope that we just found, and we're going to use this point slope formula. All right, we're just going to plug it in. So here's the slope that we just found. And I decided when I did this one to use the X as the 2 and the Y as the negative 10. And now, because they want it in slope intercept form, that means I need to make it look like y equals mx plus b. So I have to do a little bit of algebra on it. So I need to go ahead and distribute that fraction that's in the front. I need to be careful because I've got a double negative when I multiply by by that 2. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and distribute. And then I need to add up, simplify a little bit. And then I see that I have two numbers that I need to combine. Now you can do this by hand, or you can simply go to your calculator and add them up. And your calculator will spit back the, it'll give you a decimal, but if you find your F to D key, you should have an F to D. Or depending on what calculator you're using, if you're using a TI 83 or 84 under the math key, you'll see the word frac, and that'll change a decimal to a fraction. So in this case, you could also do it old school, get a common denominator, take the 10 times three over three, that gives you 28 over three minus 30 over three, which is a negative two over three. We're not so worried in this class if you can do the numbers by hand. It's great if you can. It saves you a lot of time, energy, but if you can't, don't hesitate to use your calculator, plug them in and get the correct answer. So this is in slope intercept form because I can identify the slope and I can identify the intercept right off the bat. All right, so take a second, look at this and see if you have any questions for me.
the, those are, whoops, come on. My mouse went crazy there for a second. Those are the three formulas to deal with lines, three of the formulas. You have to know something about um, parallel and perpendicular lines also, but we'll get to that. So these are the three basic formulas about lines. Any questions? Okay. All right, so here's one where it says, write the equation of a horizontal line passing through the point seven, negative three. Now, because I am so visual, I like to graph this. It's given me one point, so I'm gonna graph my point. Now it's a horizontal line, so that means it's parallel to our x-axis. So we're gonna draw a line through that point and they want the equation. Now I always ask myself, which axis did this line cross? So what do you guys think? Did it cross the x-axis or the y-axis? When I drew this line, which okay. axis did I cross? The y. y. Yeah, y. Cross the y axis. So that's going to drive the equation. What value of y do we cross at? Three. Negative three, but yeah. So the equation is y equals negative three. It only crosses one axis, so there won't be two variables in this equation. If it had been a vertical line and it crossed the x-axis, the equation would have been x equals seven. Let's say if we drew a line through here, it only crosses the x-axis. Where did it cross the x-axis? When x was seven. Most of the lines you have cross both axes. So they have an x and a y in them, but these are special lines, a horizontal and a vertical line. All right, another way they can say horizontal or vertical in a kind of a picture way is that it has no slope. So if I'm gonna go back for a second to this one. I made a note on this one, a horizontal line has a zero slope. It's kind of like if you were out skiing, there's no increase, there's no up and down, there's a zero slope. But vertical lines are what we call having undefined slope or no slope. So you'll see it both ways in the homework and in the notes. So again, I like to draw the picture. This is point 310. So if I graph the point 310, and then it has no slope. So can't go this way because that would be a zero slope. Undefined slope or no slope is a vertical line. So you can see in this case, if I want the equation for this vertical line, I see that it goes through this point and it goes only through the X axis. So that's going to drive my equation. So be careful, because sometimes they'll say undefined slope, sometimes they'll say no slope. They both mean the same thing in terms of this type of line. Okay, so any questions on vertical or um, horizontal lines. By drawing the picture, I find that I have the most luck because I can see exactly which axis it's gonna cross. And I know that's how my line is defined. All right, let's go to the next one. So here we're gonna look at perpendicular. So it's like, I have some information. You have a little bit of information of your own and I want you to find a line that's perpendicular to mine. So perpendicular slopes, what do we, anybody can tell me about perpendicular lines? What do we know about their slopes? Opposites. The opposite, that's part of it. Something else. Negative. That's still the opposite. Anybody else? The opposite inverse, you have to change its sign and flip it, both things for a perpendicular line. 
It's called the negative reciprocal. They're called the opposite reciprocal. So you, if it's negative to begin with, you change it to positive and then you flip it. So this line has a slope of negative one half. Oops. So if I flip it, it becomes two over one and change the sign. So now the slope that we're, the line that we're gonna work with has a slope of two. Now they gave us a point that they want us to use. You will never use the y-intercept from the other line. You're always gonna wanna use the point that you were given, that zero seven. And so they were really nice to us this time because by giving us this particular point, they are giving us the B. So we just figured out the slope and we can plug the slope and the B in. I'm gonna go through one where they weren't so nice and didn't give us this special point, but by giving us the X is zero, they are giving us the B. Because if you think about, if we were to graph this line, sorry about that, zero seven puts the point, oh, come on, pin, puts the point right up here. And you can see, so that is my y-intercept. That's where it crosses the y-axis. So remember, you never use its B. You always go find your own. Okay, so one of the things that we like to do with lines, and when you go to uh, college, college algebra, you'll do a lot more of this, but you'll do it with quadratic formulas, is everybody says, where will I use this? How can I apply this? Well, we have lots of SUVs in this town. So one of the models we like to look at between the years 1991 and 1999, somebody crunched all the data and came up with an equation that modeled the sales. Now it is in thousands, so we gotta keep that in mind when we think about our dollars. X is the year. So this particular application, we're looking at the function that they gave us. Oops, I don't need that, sorry. I keep forgetting I have most of this on the, the PowerPoint already. So they gave us the function, erase this. They gave us the function, they gave us the year. So all we had to do was plug in the 1994, get an answer. And a lot of times they will tell you how to round these like to one decimal, two decimals, whatever. The trick on these is because the numbers that we're dealing with are so big, they didn't multiply everything through by thousand. They brought it down to smaller numbers, but they said, when you get done, make sure you give it back to them in thousands. So if you get an answer of seven, that means they sold, they didn't sold just seven SUVs, right? They go out of business if that's all they sold. They sold 7,000 SUVs. Any questions on this one? I think the biggest trick is to remember to multiply in the end by that thousand. Now, the next group we wanna look at, <clears throat> finished our functions and lines for the most part. I wanna look at inequalities. I'm trying to get through all the different groups that you guys have to, and I'm hoping at the end, we can see if you guys have any individual questions that we can answer also. So, but don't hesitate to ask as I go through. Okay, inequalities, very, very similar to lines that we were just graphing, except they have a couple little Peculiarities be with the shading, oops, and they could potentially either be dotted or solid. So we're going to look at each one and we're going to pretend for the first part that they're all equal signs. And then we're going to deal with those questions of is it dotted or solid and which way did I shade? So we're going to look at line, the first one. We look at it, pretend it was an equal, it would just be x equals two. And that means it's a vertical line. So let's graph that vertical line. And because it was a, had an equal bar at the bottom, I made it a solid line. So keep that in mind. If it has an equal bar, doesn't matter which way it goes, it's solid. If it has just the inequalities, it's dotted. 
Okay, now this one, now some teachers have really stressed doing test points to do your shading. Some have been a little more intuitive. Some you can look at, I think, a little bit easier and, and kind of figure out which way it's supposed to shade. We want all the X values that are greater than or equal to two. So which way do you guys think this should shade? To the right or to the left? The right. Yeah. Now you can decide using a test point, plug it in, see if you get it where it fits or not. Sometimes you can just intuitive, like Brian to look at, it's greater than two, has to be to the right, doesn't it? Okay. How about line two? Is it going to be dotted or solid? Dotted. Okay. And is it going to be shaded above or below? We want all the below. lines less than our line, right? So lower or below. So you're still, you can use any of the strategies that we talked about a while ago. Graphing the line, pretending it's just y equals 3x plus 1. You see the y-intercept, so you know that that's a point on the y-axis that you can start with. You see the slope is 3 over 1, so you can do that trick that we said a while ago of going over 1 and then up 3. So there's our y-intercept. There's our going over 1, up 3. Now we said it was going to be dotted and then shaded below. And like I said, if you pick a test point and you get a true statement, you shade to include it. If you get a false statement, you shade away from it. Like this one in the notes, I said, let's try zero, zero. So if I go back and I put zero, zero into this equation, I get zero is less than zero plus one. So is zero less than one? Yes, so I get a true statement. So I shade to include it. So that's what this one would look like. One is solid and shaded to the right. One is dotted and shaded below. And you don't have to worry about any answer. They're just asking you to graph and see what the picture would look like. You don't have to come up with what the answer would look like or anything, just the picture. All right, so there was a lot of stuff to these. Any questions? Take a second, think about it. Keep in mind, you need to make draw the line, dotted or solid, and then shade three things about each line. Okay, everybody all right? Okay, let's look at the next one. So this is one where they gave you some pictures to match. Now, if you're smart and think about what we just said, look at this. It's a greater than. Is this going to be dotted or solid? Dotted. So you can eliminate two of these choices already, right? We know we're looking at this. And so it looks like the line is the same. Okay. I want it to be greater than the line. So without doing any work, which picture do you guys think is the answer? Top right. Top right. So you think this one, right? Yes. Okay. Any other ideas? Bottom. The bottom. Okay. So Robert, why did you say it was the top right? Because uh, it was the right side of the line. Oh, but we want it to be greater than the really? line. Uh -huh. So when you think of below or above, which do you think of as being greater than something? above. Mm. So you kind of got to help your brain think about it a couple different ways. So yeah, if you graph the line, all of these have the line right. Some of them are dotted, some are solid. So we got rid of the solid ones. And then we got to decide, but says this one, since it's greater than, we shade above the line. And in my notes, I said, okay, so let's say you pick a test point. You can pick a test point either above that line or below that line. In this case, if I put it back in this original, five is greater than four times one. 
five is greater than four, right? So I would want to shade the point where it includes over one of five, which is here somewhere. So you can kind of do a test point if you're not sure and you kind of got confused with your way you're shading, or you can intuitively say, hmm, greater than, that's above the line and go from there. Got it. Good. All right. Now, the other thing they asked you guys to do in equalities was to deal with some questions that had ands and ors between them. So you're going to do each one totally separate, and then we're going to put it on a number line, and then we're going to go back and decide if the, and, uh, the word between them is and or if it's an or and how that changes what part of the question that we choose. So on the first one here, I'm just going to do what I know to do to solve it for X. So I know I need to distribute and then I need to get the X by itself. So I'm going to move that three and then I'm going to divide by three. So this one ends up being X less than or equal to three. So I find three on my number line. I'm going to do this one in pink. And because it's got the equal bar, I'm gonna put the solid dot to remind myself that it actually includes that point. And then you see which way the inequality is pointing. It says X is less than or equal to this three. Less than, this goes to the left. So I'm gonna shade everything to the left. All right, let's look at the second part. Like I said, we're going to do both of them separately, and then we'll make a decision about, excuse me, what our solution is. All right, so with this one, again, I'm going to distribute. And then I'm going to start trying to isolate the X. So I'm going to bring that negative 2 over, and I get negative 2X is greater than 14. And now when I try to get the X by itself, I need to divide by negative 2. And at this point, this is a really important step. Remember, if you multiply or divide by negative, what do you do with the inequality? Flip it. Flip it. So in this case, it was greater than, but now it's less than. All right, so I'm going to put negative 7 on my number line. I'm going to shade this one with the teal color. So negative seven doesn't have an equal bar, so I'm going to put up an open circle. And this one also says go to the left. So I'm going to shade it. So this is the point now I've got both of them graphed. Now I don't know the answer yet because I have to go back and look to see, is this an and or an or? An and is only where they overlap each other. So if you're not pink and blue, I don't want you. And that's why I use two different colors here. I can see that they overlap here from negative infinity to the negative seven. So that's the answer if it were an and. Now, because we've already done the work, I'm gonna talk about this one in terms of what if this were or between the two expressions. And or is very inclusive. Either you or I can contribute. So or is like, bring it all. If anybody shaded it, I include it in my answer. So in this case, anything that was pink or blue gets shaded. And because it ends with three, which had a solid dot, I end with a bracket. So this one goes all the way from negative infinity up to three and has a bracket. Now the seven had a parenthesis because it had an open circle where it ended. So that the work itself doesn't change. I like to graph them and then go back and see what the heck did they ask me to do? The and or the or, and and that's only where they agree or where they overlap, pink and blue had the be the same place. Or, like I said, if anybody shaded it, we include it. All right, how are we doing with this one? The question, the, the equation that they give you are not too crazy usually here. There is that trick of watching 
for the negative, when you divide by that negative or multiply by the negative, you have to flip the sign. And I would expect one or both of them to have that in them, graph them, and then decide, and or or. Okay. Any questions, any comments on this one? If you're doing a pencil paper test, it's easier to color. If you're doing it on the computer, you, on your paper, you might wanna have a marker or something where you can do them in different colors. It makes it pretty and it makes it easy to see your solution. All right, let's look at the next type. Okay, now this one, they've crammed it all together. And I kind of like to think of this one like a train. You know, if you do something to the beginning of a train, it affects the end of the train, right? The caboose follows the engine. So it's like three separate pieces. So I kind of think about, I, I'm the oldest originally of three, and then I have a lot more siblings after that. But if you gave candy to one of us, you better give candy to the rest. So thinking about there are three separate areas, three separate pieces separated with the inequalities. And our goal is still to solve for X. So one thing I suggest to my students is this looks kind of weird. So what would happen though, if you covered up the first part and didn't look at it, pretend it wasn't there, would you know how to solve this? And 99% of the time students say, oh yeah, I know what to do with that. I just move the five and I start giving the X by itself. So we wanna keep in mind that that's what you would do if you only had two of the pieces. It's still what we're gonna do if we have all three, we just have to keep this thing balanced so the train doesn't go off the track and we're going to do the minus five that we saw up here. We're going to do it to all three pieces. And then we're going to simplify. And then, okay, my goal is still to isolate the X, right? Got to get the X by itself. So at this point, I can see I need to divide everybody by three. So that means I divide all three regions by three. And then I simplify. And here's my solution. And so now we need to write it. They don't usually tell you how they write it, but we know they don't like it like this. Typically want us to condense it and write it in interval notation. So I see there's no equal bar here. So I can see the two is gonna get a parenthesis. And I do see that there's an equal bar with the eight thirds. So I know it's going to get a bracket. And now if they had asked you not to do it in, um, Set builder, then let's see what that would look like, just in case. So then you would just bring what you have solved and done it, did it like this for set builder. That way you've seen it both ways, no matter how they ask you for it, interval notation or set builder. Okay, any questions on this one? Now, did that help when I covered up the first part? Did it make it easier for you guys to see? Yes. Okay. There's all kinds of little tricks to get through math, right? You gotta know the tricks to win the game. So, all right, let's look at exponents. You guys spent a lot of time this semester with exponents. And if you go on to college algebra, you will spend a lot of time again. And everything that you've learned in this class, except for systems equations, you will use in college algebra again. Now, if you go on to pre-calc, you'll use that system of equations again. All right, so one of the things you dealt with, there was a bunch of rules you guys had, was dealing with negative exponents. And those guys in togas years ago decided negative exponents were illegal. So we've come up with a lot of different ways to get rid of them. And we know that this negative exponent applies to the whole fraction, right? It applies to the top and it applies to the bottom. So one of the shortest ways to get rid of the negative exponent is to flip the fraction. And then I can apply that square to the top and to the bottom and then get my final answer. Any questions? The other way I have seen some instructors do is go ahead and just distribute the negative. 
That means both things have a negative exponent. So that means the six wants to go to the top and the seven wants to go to the bottom. And then you could simplify. And you can see either way that you think it through, either just flipping the fraction to remove the negative or distributing and then moving the negative pieces, you get the exact same answer. So whichever way makes more sense to your brain, do it that way. All right, let's look at rule number one, typically. We've dealt, well, we've read the second one for the day, I guess, because we've dealt with negative exponents. So here we're multiplying and the bases are the same. What do we do with those exponents? Add them. Add them up, yep. So we're just gonna keep the base and we are going to add those exponents. Come on, PowerPoint. All right, so keep the base, add the exponents. This is where you can add the fractions by hand. Sometimes they're really nice, like this one where it has a common denominator. Sometimes you might wanna to go to your calculator or go old school on it and get a common denominator off the side and just come back and simplify it and be sure, don't leave it if it reduces or they'll count it wrong. Go ahead and reduce it as far as you can reduce it. Okay, so when you're multiplying, you add. So of course, when you divide, you gotta do the opposite, right? So I thought we'd go ahead and deal with the opposite division here in terms of your scientific notation, because you guys did some of that to help with the science classes that you're in. So when I look at these, I look at the numbers and then I look at the part that has exponents. That way it kind of keeps things separated in my brain. So I regroup them. I'm going to deal with the numbers and then I'm going to deal with the exponent part. So the numbers, I can divide that and I get a 3.1. Now with the exponents, remember we said when you're dividing, you subtract. So I've got a negative 15 minus the negative three that was on bottom. Now here, I see those lovely double, double negatives. So I'm gonna clean that up. And that way I'd have negative 15 plus three and I end up with a negative 12. I'm a big grouper when I do um, exponents, you know, like putting the X's above each other, putting the Y's above each other, putting the numbers, things without exponents, things with exponents, anything to help my brain kind of differentiate the rules that I have to use. All right, here's one with a group. So now multiplying, we added, dividing, we subtracted with a group. We do what with our exponents? Multiply them. Very good. Now the trick is the exponents behave differently than the numbers. So the best way I found to do this is to separate them into three groups. Oops, I have one of these doubles, sorry. Let me get rid of that. So the four is to the second power, the y squared is to the second power, and the z to the negative three is to the second power. That way I can do numbers the way I know to do numbers. So four squared gives me a 16. I use the multiplier rule on the Y's and on the Z's. So when I do that, I get 16, Y to the fourth, Z to the negative six. And I mentioned a while ago, we're not allowed to leave a negative exponent. So it's not happy here floating on the top. So I want to create a fraction and let him move to the bottom where he'll be happy. So if it was negative on bottom, you move it to the top. If it's negative on top, you can think of this as like over one. If it's negative on top, we're gonna move it to the bottom. We're doing a reciprocal, but this is kind of a shortcut way to think it through. Any questions on this one? And now the other thing you learn to do is change back and forth between radical and rational exponents. So anytime I see a fraction as an exponent, 
I know it's going to go to some kind of radical, some kind of square root, cube root, fourth root, something like that. And this comes in really handy because sometimes it's easier to do in one form than the other. We probably at this point know square roots and cube roots better because we've done them all through like junior high and high school than we do rationals. The next class that you deal with, sometimes the rationals are a lot easier to work with. So you wanna be able to go back and forth and that's why they introduced it in this class. So anytime you see a fraction, I want you to think radicals. And I have a little trick for deciding which goes inside and which goes outside. So when I think of this, I ask myself, where are the roots on a tree? The roots on a tree are always on the bottom. They're not sticking up in the air, right? So I know that this is the root or the index of my radical. So I know it's a square root, 16 goes to the inside, and then the three is the outside power. And then you can simplify the square root of 16 and get your four, and then four to the third power is a 64. So any questions? Remember the root, roots on tree are on bottom, so I know this is my root number, whatever it is. And you know, we're kind of lazy, so if this is a square root, we typically don't write it, but it's got a little invisible two sticking right in there. So if I had, oh, let's say 16 to the four fifths, how would you guys rewrite this? What would the index be? Five. Okay, 16 goes inside, and what would go outside? Four. Very good. Okay, now factoring. You guys spent a lot of time factoring. And I have to tell you, it's one of the key skills, even if you're going to go on to college algebra or pre-calc or trig or calculus, factoring is a key skill. So the more time you can spend with factoring, the better you can get at it now. Don't lose it. Keep your notes. Anything you've got on factoring, keep it handy. All right. So we're going to do a bunch of factoring here. How are we doing? Oh, we're about five o'clock. Okay, we're good. We're doing good. Okay, so factoring. You guys had a bunch of steps that you were taught as you go through. First thing, you always look for a GCF, right? Look to see, do they have anything in common that I can factor out and simplify? So I look at this and I say, hmm, two and 18. Well, they're both even numbers. So I know they both have a two. And I see some X's in both terms. So this one only has one X that I could pull out and that'll leave some here. So they both have a two and an X in common. So I'm pulling that to the front and then I look to see what's left behind. So now you guys had a bunch of special ones and this happens to be one of those. One of those, it was had a, so special, it had its own name. Difference of two squares. So I know we rewrite this one, the same, they look exactly the same. Factors of nine that are the same, factors of X squared that are the same. One gets a plus, one gets a minus. Now, because this one said factor, I'm done. I don't, I'm not solving. I don't have to get an answer. And that's where I see students mess up a little bit on the test is they keep going. And they're like, I have to keep going. I have to solve. It's like, no, sometimes I'm only asking you to factor, break it into pieces and then stop. Sometimes I am actually you to solve, but it would have to be equal to something if I were to keep going. This is because it's just an expression. It's not equal. It's not an equation. I cannot solve for X. All right, so GCF, difference of two squares. Those are two of our tools. All right, one other thing you were asked to do with all these factoring stuff is in terms of a rational fraction. So maybe we can do some canceling if we were to break it down. Now, don't try to cancel the x squared on top and the x squared on bottom because of the pluses between. You have to cancel things as a group. So if you were to factor the top and factor the bottom, once you turn it to multiplication, then you can cancel from top to bottom. So now when I look at the top, I'm like, hmm, I see that these guys have some stuff in common. 
So I'm going to do a GCF. They both have an X. And so that would leave me with an X out front and an X plus two on the inside. When I look at the bottom, factors of two that add up to three. Oh, two and one, right? Okay, so we can factor the top by pulling out just a GCF. The bottom, we can factor this trinomial. X and X is gonna give us the X squared back. One times two are the factors of two. So remember the last number, the factors go here, but they have to add up to the middle. And now I can see my favorite thing. I love to cancel, love, love, love it. I look to see, is there anything that's the same on top and bottom? And I'm like, yes, yay, there is. I get to cancel that X plus two. And then as what's left is my final answer. So you're gonna have some trinomials where the first coefficient is a one, and you can kind of use the, the trial and error method, just looking at the factors of the last number, break it apart that way. Some are gonna be more complicated. We're gonna talk about those. Any questions on this? Stop for a second, take a drink of water, see if you guys have any thoughts. And if you're struggling with factoring, that's perfectly normal. You just need to keep working at it. And eventually that light bulb will come on. You'll say, oh, okay, is this all there was to it? It just, some people get it right away and some people have to really chew on it and work harder at it. All right, sometimes they ask you to just solve this weird looking equation. And again, this is for our science classes that you're gonna take and the business classes because they've got lots of equations and like the counting and find economics and stuff. So we want you to be able to solve for whatever they ask you to do. So in this case, Oops, we were asking you to solve for A. A, I don't know what A was in this case, but A was important in this topic. So I see my A's are not even on the same side yet. So I've got to get the like terms together. Luckily that Z was already on the other side, so I'm going to leave him over there. And you got to think about what strategies do you know that will allow you to get the A away from everybody else. If you knew what the value as M was, you could actually just deal with the numbers. But because it's this thing we don't know, I need to get the A's away. So the only way I know to isolate those A's is to factor it. So I'm gonna factor it to the front. And now I've created a multiplication situation. And I know I can get rid of the multiplication by dividing both sides by that term. So all I was asked to do was solve for A, get the A by itself. I don't know what the value is because nobody told me what Z was or M was. So questions. Any questions on this one? Because I would expect to see this. I would pay probably a month's salary expecting to see this. And when you go to college algebra, I expect to see this again. Okay. Now, one of the other things that we've been doing since, what, third grade or something, we just get more and more complicated as we get older, is finding the common denominator for two fractions, right? Now, these were numbers, we would pick them apart, see what they had in common, see what the largest multiple was or the lowest multiple. But because they're polynomials, the only way I can see what they have in common is if I factor them. So I factor the first one, I see it has a common term of two, so I can pull out the two. I need to look at the second one and it's my, oh, it's that difference of two squares again, some squared minus some squared. So I can break it apart into x plus one, x minus one. So now if I want to find a common denominator, has to include the stuff from both. So this is the way I kind of like to do it. I, I write each of them down. I start with what they have in common. So you see the x minus one, they both share that. So my LCM has to include 
what they share. I don't write it twice unless it shows up twice in both. But if they share it, I bring it down once. And then I don't see anything else they share. So then I just bring everybody else down that was included. So I bring the two down and I bring the X plus one down. Now the order that I write these, it doesn't matter, but we're used to seeing our numbers in front of our factors. So that's probably how they would write this if it were a multiple choice. So start by factoring their bottoms. Look to see what they have in common. So write it down. And then I kind of call them the orphans. I don't know what else to call them. Whatever is left, you bring down and add also. Any questions? Everybody okay with this? You guys got really quiet. So come on, give me some feedback. Are you okay still? Okay, I'm assuming quiet means you got it. If not, you need to let me know. Now we're gonna use that later on to actually do some subtraction and addition, but I wanted to take a jump first to do something else I like with canceling. So division, in math, there really are no rules for division except for to change it to a multiplication. So years ago, I learned the saying, keep change flip to do with division. So you keep the top or you keep the first, change it to multiplication and then flip the second. So keep change flip, that means we keep the first, change it to multiplication, flip the second. Now I would love to be able to cancel except for everything needs to be factored before I do that. So we gotta go through and factor each piece. So as you work on it, you can see the top here Factors of one that add up to two are gonna be a one and a one. I can't factor X minus two any further. Can't factor X minus X plus one any further. The two X minus four has a common term of two. So if I rewrite everything in terms of its factors, here's the one plus one giving me the two. This one stayed, this one stayed. This one had a common term of two. And now I can start seeing what I can cancel. And it doesn't matter if it's on the same fraction or if it's first fraction to second fraction, it just has to be top to bottom. So I can see the X plus one will cancel and the X minus two will cancel. And then your next step is just in case you're not done, you might be, you might have missed something. It's always a good idea after you do a little bit of canceling, stop and rewrite what's left. See if you miss something that cancels, like if there had been a four left on bottom, but in this case there wasn't. So I could leave it as two times parentheses x plus one, or I could go ahead and distribute since there's not much there. So take a second, look at this. Again, it's got a bunch of our factoring strategies. And then first important thing before you start factoring though is do the keep change flip, flip it. So you don't get distracted by factoring and then forget to flip it. So do the flip first and then factor everybody and then reduce. Now, if I'm going too fast, you guys need to say so because I've got it all written out. So I know it goes a little faster this way. So if you need me to stop or go back and explain a step, please let me know. All right, let's check the next one out. All right, so now this one has a fraction on one side and a whole number on the other. So there's two ways to think about this one. I think I did it by just multiply both sides by the denominator. Since we have an equal, that'll get rid of the fraction. You could have also put a one at the bottom over here 
and thought of it as a cross multiply. Some teachers do it one way, some teachers do it the other. They both will work. All right, so to get rid of the fractions, because it's an equation, we just multiply by the denominator, clear everything up. As long as we do it to both sides, we keep it balanced. And then we can see that it will cancel the x plus one on the left-hand side. So we're left with no fraction. And we're left with x equals on the left and then the two times the x plus one over here. Now, because it's got a grouping symbol, I do need to go ahead and distribute. And then I'm just trying to solve for x. So I get my x's on one side and so that gives me a negative x equals two. So I just need to divide both sides by a negative one and I get my final answer. Now there's one thing, I'm glad I put it on the slide because I forgot to address it. Because it's a fraction, you remember early on, we talked about the domain of fractions and we are not allowed to have a zero on bottom. So one of the things that limits my solutions for this problem is anything that would make this bottom go to zero. So remember early on, we talked about just set the bottom equal to zero. And when I did that, x plus one equals zero, I solved it, I got x equals negative one. So if when I had solved this, if I had gotten x equals negative one, I would have said there's no solution. But because negative two is not in our limit, it is in our domain, we're good to go to list that as our solution. So when you have fractions, that's one thing you probably need to kind of do first so you don't forget to do it when you're solving. Find out your domain, because the domain on this one would have been, let's see if we do it in set builder, x not equal to negative one. So any other x is legitimate. Sometimes I get so excited just solving and multiplying both sides, I forget to check for that limit that critical value that would limit my solutions. So the other way, if I were here, your teacher may have done it, is put the, like I said, put that that way and then do a cross multiply kind of thing where you get X equals two times X plus one. And then you can see it's exactly the same. So some of them teach multiplying both sides by the denominator, and some teach a little bit more with uh, the cross multiply. So both ways will give you the exact same solution. One's just a shortcut of the other. Okay, so now we got a bunch of rational fractions. They didn't ask me to solve, they just asked me to build the LCD. We did this a while ago with two fractions. Now we wanna do it with three. So I'm going to look at each one, break them into their components, and then we'll talk about how to build our LCD. So the first one, we, we saw this one a while ago. First component, uh, first coefficient is a one, so that gives me x squared. The last one is a one, so the fa only factors of one are one and one. Fortunately, one plus one gives me a two. Looking at the second one, I see that they have a two in common. So I factor that GCF out. The last one, I say, oh, you're a difference of two squares. So you're going to go to x plus one, x minus one. So now we've got three things that we're comparing. So a while ago, we started out to see if there was anything that they shared. I always start there. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Do you guys see anything that all three of them share? All of, them, all of them share X. But not by itself. It's in a group and some of these, right? Mm -hmm. So can't do that. There's nothing that all three of them share is there that's exactly the same. So if, none, if there's nothing that all three share, then I start by looking at what things do two of them share at least, kind of whittle my way down. So I can see two of them at least have an X plus one. So I'm gonna put that into my least common denominator. And then I start looking to see, is there anything else two of them share? 
and I can see that these two had an x minus one. So I bring that down and I'm looking again, is there anything you guys share? No, no, no. Okay, so I'm gonna bring the two down. I'm gonna bring that other x plus one down as part of the LCD. So this one ended up with two of the x plus one factors because one of them was a shared factor. One was an additional factor that the first fraction needed to have all of its pieces matching. So let's just check real quickly. The first fraction needed two of the x plus ones. Yes and yes, okay. The second fraction needed a two and an x minus one, okay. A two and an x minus one, cool. The third fraction needed to make sure there was one x plus one and one x minus one. So I can see that here, an x plus one and an x minus one. So all of these find themselves reflected in this LCD. Looking, first of all, for if there's something all three share, if that doesn't happen, look for what two of them share and keep going until you find everything that's shared or in common and then bring down what's left. So these guys, this and this only showed up in two, one at a time. This was a shared and this was a shared. So I started by bringing those down. Robert, you have a question? Okay. Brianne and Eric, you guys still okay? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Good. All right. So now this next one, because it's an actual subtraction, I need a common denominator and then I need to actually apply it and go through it. So we played with common denominators or LCDs a couple times. So we know we have to look at the bottoms. So we start there, break down the bottom of the first one. Second one, there's not much to break down. So I need to build an LCD. I start by looking at what they have in common. So I see they both share an X plus three. And then the first one also needs me to show throw in an X minus three. So both of them have to have that to have the common denominator. So L, x minus three, x plus three, the first fraction is already there, good to go. But I noticed that the second fraction didn't have everything it needed. So I needed to multiply the bottom by an x minus three. And we've all learned to gotta keep things balanced with fractions. So if I multiply the bottom by something, I have to multiply the top by the exact same thing. So identify your LCD, check and see if what they're missing. And if they're missing part of it, multiply by that. Okay, and now I can see they both have the same common denominator. So I can go ahead and bring them together with one fraction. So I have the five X from the first one, I've got the minus four, and then I've got the X minus three that I multiplied by. And now I need to get rid of this parenthesis on top. So I need to go ahead and distribute Watching my signs, as it's tricky with those negatives. All right, so I'm going to distribute that. And that's going to give me a negative 4 and a positive 12. And now I see some like terms that I could combine. And that's going to give me x plus 12 over our common denominator. Now, at this point, you need to check and see if anything reduces. In this case, it didn't because x plus 12 is not the same as x plus 3 or x minus 3. But if there was an x plus 3 or something like that up here, you would need to reduce if possible. So anytime you're adding or subtracting, you need to build an LCD, factor the bottoms, determine what you'd have to have in it that makes both of them happy and covered. Multiply by what you're missing, and then go ahead and distribute and add up like terms. And I purposely threw a minus in here, just so you can see again that double negative. They like to do that just to see if you're paying attention.
adding and subtracting only, not when you're multiplying or dividing. All right, here's another dividing. This was one of the last sections you guys did with the fractions, the complex fractions. Um, so I want you to think about if I were to write this in a slightly different way, I have this top fraction. I don't know if I wrote this on a slide, so let me write it over here. X squared minus 16 is being divided by the bottom fraction. And sometimes it's easier for some people to see if they rewrite it like this. So you can do the keep change flip on it. It's one kind of visual trick. So let me go ahead and write the next step. So rewrite it. I didn't need to do it over here. Whoops. Okay. Let me get rid of that so it's cleaner. So rewrite it as a keep, you know, as a fraction divided by a fraction. Do the keep change flip. Factor everybody so that we can do canceling. So here x didn't factor, x minus 4 wouldn't factor, but here we had a lovely difference of two squares, factors of 16 that are the same. And now everybody's factored. We said we did the keep change flip to begin with, and then we could start canceling. So I see that there's an x minus 4 on top and bottom. I think that's all that cancels, so I'm going to bring everybody over to see what's left on the top. All I see is an x. On the bottom, I had x plus 4, but it was multiplied by a 1, so it stayed an x plus 4. Now, don't get cancel happy and cancel this x and this x, because x is not the same as x plus 4. All right, process for a minute, see what you think. This is one way to do it. You guys probably were also shown a second way. I think this is the easier way to process. You may have been shown multiplying top and bottom by something. That works also. Any questions? The other one I want to show you, because a lot of times they throw something on this, like on the final, is let's say you had xt over m over yt over x. So if you do it the same way, leave the top. Doesn't always have to have stuff you can factor. Keep, change, flip. And then you can still do a different color. You can still do the canceling. I see a T and a T. And so you end up with X squared over M Y. So this could be numbers, it could be letters, it could be things you need to factor. Anything is fair game. All right, so we're going to do a little bit with the quadratics because you guys finished up with quadratics and imaginary numbers. And then we're going to do also some applications like the triangles that you guys did. So there's a couple ways you guys talked about doing quad solving quadratic equations. One is factoring. One is using um, the quadratic formula. So I've got some of both. Now factoring, the ones we've done up to now have been I would have to say a little more basic of the trinomials or the difference of two squares or the GCF. I kind of wanted to save the more interesting ones for the end here because we got our brain muscles going, we're good to go. So one of the ways I like to do um, factoring that I didn't learn until I was way teaching classes is called the AC method that the Chinese, from what I understand, invented. So if it's a quadratic formula, we've learned to identify the A, Bs, and Cs. And the AC method says take the A times the C. So in this case, we can see A is two, B is five, C is negative three. But if you're using AC method, 
you only need the A and the C. So if I take A times C, I get negative six. So this is the part that you have to be very careful with and very thorough. But if it factors, you will always be able to find the factors this way. If you have to use the quadratic formula, none of the choices will give you the middle term. So looking at negative six, you look at all the factors of negative six and it's negative. So one has to be positive, one has to be negative. So I know one times six, and then I can do it again, switching to negative. The other factor of six would be two and three. One time the two is positive, the other time it's negative. So I think that's all the choices for this particular number. I need to go back and find out which of these will give me a positive five if I add them together. So if you add the first one, you get a negative five. If you add the second one, you get a positive five. So that's going to be the one I want. And if I keep going, I could see this would give me a negative one. This would give me a positive one. So not the right choices. So we're going to use that choice of the one and negative six. And what we're going to do is we're going to do something that will allow us to use the grouping method. So we're going to break the middle term down into a, a negative 1x and a positive 6x, still 5x. So leave the first one the same, leave the last one the same, break the middle term down into what you found are the factors that will add up and give you the right middle term. Now, most of my students like the grouping method, and that's why I think this is so successful for a lot of them, because they can now see that it's four terms, and so we can use grouping. So that means we're going to use look at only two at a time and see what they have in common, and then we'll go back big picture. So you look at the first two, and you say, hmm, what do they have? Oh, they both have an X, okay? What do the second two have in common? Hmm, they both have a three, okay? So I'm gonna factor an X out of the first two and it leaves me with two X minus one. Now you can think of this if you, if it would help, you know, say factor it out, you can go off to the side and divide by what we think is the common term and that will help you figure out what's left. Six and three, both have a three that goes into it. When I divide both of those by three, I'm left with two X minus one. And now I like to call it the magic term because this is where the magic happens. You see here, it matches, that's so cool. So we're gonna bring that one out of both groups and then we're gonna look to see what's left. The first one had an X that was left. Second one had a three that was left. And so now you can see I have factored this trinomial, even though it took me a minute, had to do the choices, had to think about what would break up to give me the five. I have factored the trinomial. And now because it is a solve, I'm gonna take both of those factors and set them equal to zero and solve them. And that'll give me my two solutions. This is the method you want to use probably if you're struggling at all to break down the trinomials or if the first coefficient is not a one. Okay, so take a second, process, let me know. Now, some teachers teach the AC method slightly different. We most of all use, you know, the combinations of six. Um, and if you need some more help with this method, if this is the type that's you throw in you, you can definitely sign in for tutoring after the group today, or you can sign in this week and get help. But I love the AC method because I struggled when I learned factoring and I tried and tried all kinds of different combinations. And when I found this method that like straight, you know, prescription, you do this, then this, then this, and it will absolutely tell you if this thing factors nice and pretty, or if you have to use the quadratic equation, I tell you, I almost cried because it made my, my life so much easier.
All right. No questions? Everybody's okay? Now, if you can just see it, you don't have to use this method. This is not a have to. If you can look at this and see what the factors would be, that's lovely. That's great. But if you can't, don't beat yourself up. This method will help you. Okay, here's another simplify. So remember, it's not telling me to solve, so I won't get an answer for X. All they're asking me to do is reduce if possible. So I do have to factor and see how does this break down? Not much I can do with the top, but I gave you this one because it's got one of the tricks that they like to put into problems. So if we factor the bottom, we, know, we notice it's a difference of two squares. Four is a perfect square. 25 is a perfect square. So the square root of four is two and two. The square root of 25 is that five and five. And now you look at it and you see, hmm, I don't see anything that's the same. But then I start looking a little bit more and I'm like, five X minus two, two minus five X. Wait, those are the same except for they have opposite signs. The five is positive, then it's negative. The two is negative and then it's positive. So this is the type that they taught you to factor out a negative on one of them. And it doesn't matter if it was the top one or the bottom one. So if we factor a negative one out of the top, it'll make the five negative and it'll make the two positive, which makes it exactly match the bottom one. So watch for this. It could be anything where it starts out three minus X, X minus three, Notice exactly the same, except for the signs change. Doesn't matter what it is, T minus five, exactly the same, except for opposite signs. Those factors were always reduced if you pull out that negative one, and you'll be able to reduce your fraction that you were given. So factor it, like you would have anyway. And then if you start saying, wait, um, nothing cancels. What am I missing? Something's probably going to cancel on each one. So if you don't see it, then you can say, oh, wait, wait, wait. Hmm, you're exactly the same, except for the signs are changed. So I know I can cancel you and leave a negative one behind. Okay. Factoring again, um, they like to do this, you know, which one's a factor. They didn't ask you to factor the whole thing. They didn't ask us to solve it. They didn't tell you how to do it. So it's up to you at this point, how you want to do it. I, I, like I said, I'm a big fan of the AC method. So I don't think I showed my steps on this one. I think I just factored it. But what I would do, I would do the AC. I would take two times negative nine and get a negative 18, build my chart, one, 18, negative one, 18. What goes into 18 next is two and nine, two and nine, so one time negative, one time negative, um, three and six. Again, switch in the negatives. And then I go back to my problem and say, oh, they have to add up to positive three. And I see down here, this guy adds up to positive three. So I'm going to take the original trinomial. I'm going to keep the first term. I'm going to keep the last term. And I'm going to break this one into a negative 3x plus 6x. And then I'm going to do the grouping method. So I'm going to look at two at a time see what they have in common. Looks like the only thing these guys share is an X. So 2X minus three, bring down the sign. Looks like these guys share a three. If I divide both of them by three, I'm left with 2X minus three. There's that magic matching factor. Whoops, come back, give me a racer, come on, PowerPoint. Wrote them backwards. <laughs> All right, so they have a common term of 2x minus 3. 
And then what's left is the X plus the three. So that's that one in a little bit more details. It looks like I changed the sign. So this fix. It's a good thing I did it this way. I need to fix this, sorry. So now we just come over here and we look to see which matches. That's all we had to do. So it's a good thing I checked it because that's the wrong answer. <laughs> okay. You guys have also worked with systems of equations this semester. You looked at graphing, which we said we don't use very often, but it's not very accurate and takes a long time. You looked at substitution and you looked at elimination. You also looked at three types of answers. So we're gonna hopefully talk about those as we go through. All right, so this is a question that they like to ask you. If something is a solution to your system, that means it would occur on both. So how many times do these two lines cross each other? How many solutions do you see? Just one, yes. So there's one solution. There's gonna be one X and one Y that lives on both of these lines. Now, you guys have also talked about lines that are parallel, oh, stop it, that are parallel. How many times do they cross each other? So that would be an empty set. You guys have also talked about lines that live right on top of each other. How many times do they touch each other? All over the place, right? So this is where you had like your all real numbers or something like that type of solution. So three different things could occur as you're doing these systems of equations. Most of the ones typically have one X, one Y that agree. Every once in a while you'll get one where it ends up like says three equal to two. Well, that never is true. So that means there are probably parallel lines and there's no places where they agree. Or you'll get something that says five equals five. Well, that's always true. So that means it was probably the same line and somebody just arbitrarily multiplied one of them by a number, so they don't look the same. So we're gonna go through and look at some different solutions. Like I said, most of the time, you're either gonna use substitution or elimination. And they don't always typically tell you what to do, so you kind of have to decide what's the best strategy, because they will both work. Now, as soon as I see one variable by itself, my brain says, oh, this is substitution, we're on. Because that Y is already by itself. And I know this Y is the same as this Y. So I can just substitute this Y and turn it into a three X. And then look at that, it allows me to solve for X fairly quickly. So now I have my X value, I can go back and substitute it into either one of these and that will give me the y value. So in this case, I plug the x is one in here and I got x, a y is three. Now on a test, I would take both and go to the other equation just to check and make sure I didn't add or subtract wrong. So if x is one and y is three, does that equal four? Yeah, four equals four, so I know I'm good. So my final answer is the point one comma three. So substitution, because the variables by itself, the easiest way to do when one of them's by themselves. Now, if that's not the case, like this one, neither one is by themselves. We're going to do the elimination method. That means we're going to try to get rid of one variable, focus on the other, and then come back and do substitution. So when I look at this one, and you can decide, do you want to get rid of the X's or do you want to get rid of the Y's? But I got really excited when I see this type of problem because one of the X's, one of the Y's is positive and one's negative already. So I know that they're going to cancel without me doing a lot of work to them. So if I line them up, I can see when I add them together, the X's can be combined and the y's will cancel. And now I only have to deal with the x's to begin with. I can solve that for the x value. 
And then I can go back and do the elimination method, plug in the X value that I just got and use it to solve for the Y. Again, if this were me on a test, I would then go to my second equation. If I was you, plug in both the X and the Y that we found just to verify, because it's so easy to add two numbers together, you know, like three plus two and say six, you know, your brain's stressed, it's a test. You want to just give yourselves as much double checks and back checking as you can. So either substitution or elimination are going to be your strategies for these systems of equations. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's look at the next one then, okay? Look at a good old quadratic formula. If you're still struggling to remember it, go back to YouTube. There's all kinds of songs that'll help you. You know, there's a song with some of Beyonce's music, there's Star Wars, there's Farajaka, all kinds of strategies to help you remember this formula because you have to know it, you're not gonna give it to you. All right, so quadratic just means it's to the second power. Now, we could try the other methods like factoring or use the AC, but sometimes those don't work because of the size of the numbers or because of the signs. So we're gonna use the quadratic formula on this one. So we have to know the quadratic formula first. We have to label our A, Bs, and Cs and you don't wanna do that until you make sure they're in the right order. If the number comes first, you wanna move things around, don't change your signs necessarily, or if there's some on both sides, get them all the same side, it has to be equal to zero. Our A is gonna be the number in front of the X squared term, our B is the number in front of the X to the first, and our C is always the constant. So it's always, I think it's important to write them down. Come on. Get it in standard form, as I mentioned, write them down. Now I know what A is, what B is, and what C is. Then I can start plugging them into this formula. Again, every time I substitute, I like to put it in parentheses, just keeps it a little bit cleaner. <clears throat> I think it makes it easier to see like here in front, I have double negatives. And in the inside, I'm squaring a negative number. All right, so we're going to simplify everything. That gives me a positive 2 in front. <clears throat> negative 2 squared gives me a positive 4. Negative times positive times negative gives me a negative 12. Let's add up the inside there. So I get a square root of a negative 8. So at the very end of this class, you talked about your little imaginary friends, those imaginary numbers that pop up once in a while. And before they would have said, oh, I can't do this. It's the square root of a negative number. The imaginary numbers allow us to go a little bit further. So as soon as I see a square root that has a negative, I remember that square root of negative one is equal to I. So I'm gonna break this apart into, and I didn't write that step, but I would have rewritten it as a square root of negative one and a square root of eight. That way I can replace the square root of negative one with an I, and then I can go ahead and break down the eight. I know that eight goes to four and two. Four is a perfect square, so I know I can break it down. So now when I come back over here and I replace that square root of negative eight, I'm going to have an I and I'm going to have the two square roots of two. Now, the last thing you want to do on these guys is always check and see if it reduces. And there's two ways to do it. And I actually wrote the way I don't like. So let me do that. But I want to show you how I like it better. I now have decided that I like writing this as two separate fractions. Come on, give me my pen show you real quick what I mean. So I like to take the top. Oh, come on. Let me write. I like to take the first piece over the bottom, plus or minus the second piece over the bottom. 
And then I can see two reduces to six, leaves me with a three. This two relieves the six, leaves me with a three. So I end up with one plus or minus i times the square root of two. Now on your homework, you guys have, have learned that you have to separate it into two separate answers, I think. So I lost my three at the bottom. Because this first one reduces to one third plus or minus i square root of two over three. So you can write it like this, one third plus i square root of two over three, and then one third minus i square root of two over three. It's important to make sure it's in standard form so that you get the right A, the right B, and the right C. Watch the signs and watch your signs over here with for double negatives. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a second, see if you guys have questions. We did a lot of work on this one. Okay, let's look at the next one then. Okay, so we're still doing more with rational fractions. Um, so at this point, it's already a multiply. We've done a lot with division earlier. So I wanted to throw just a multiply one in where you didn't have to do the keep change flip. You're just doing the reducing part. So remember you factor everybody if they factor, like the n plus one doesn't factor. The first one, they both have a five in common. The bottom of the first looks like a difference of two squares. The second bottom looks like a factor out of three. So I go through and I factor everybody. And then I like to do this kind, you guys know, I've already said that. I like to cancel. I don't know what it is. It's one of those little guilty pleasures. So look to top to bottom, anything that's the same, and then let's see what's left. It didn't say solve, so I'm not looking for an answer. All I was looking to do was clean it up and reduce it. So you can see how important factoring is as a skill. We've used it so many ways this semester. And like I said, it's just going to stay, 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 stay important to you. Any questions on this one? Typically, when there's more factoring and stuff to be done, they won't give you as involved of trinomials or binomials to factor. They just want to look more at the strategies that you're, you have. Okay, radicals. So we have radicals, and then I think we have um, the applications that I mentioned. So we did one, the very first one we did was similar to this where we were take, given an X value and we were asked to plug it in. It doesn't matter what the function looks like. We're still just gonna take this X value and simplify it. So substitute it in, and then you can go to your calculator, three times five thirds minus five, or you can do it by hand. It's up to you at this point. So, the threes cancel, we're left with five minus five. So actually the absolute, the putting it in this function, we get a value of zero, which I didn't see coming. It cleaned up really nicely. So don't let the fact that it's a square root throw you. You're still just being given an X value and you're substituting in and simplifying. Okay, sometimes you have to break the square root down. Um, I kept, I chose a kind of small one here, but this strategy works with all of them. I like to go back old school and do a factor tree. So you can also do it if there's a number that's a perfect square that you know goes into 12. And I think that's how I did it here. But I can also take the 12 and start breaking it down. Uh, two into six, doesn't matter where I start. 
6 breaks down 2 and 3. So I can see the square root of 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. Square roots are looking for pairs. So here's a pair I can bring to the front. He doesn't have enough buddies, so he has to stay inside. So you can either look at the factors of this that are perfect squares and break it down that way, or if you don't know what goes into it, just good, good old factor tree and start breaking down the pieces. All right, so the same thing here. I can look at 50. And my brain says 50, oh, that's two quarters. Okay, so I know 25 is a perfect square. You might look at 18 and say, oh, I know what goes into that. If not, go factor tree on it. I knew that 50 was 25 times two. I remembered that 18 was nine times two. 18 is a perfect, I mean, nine is a perfect square. 25 is a perfect square. So I can simplify, break those apart, and then simplify them. And so I end up with five square roots of two plus three square roots of two. Because the radicals match, it's like saying five apples plus three apples. Those are the same kinds of things. So I can combine those. I don't change the radical. I just add the coefficients. Oops. I do want to say one thing. If one of these was a square root of two and one was a square root of three, that'd be trying to add like apples and oranges and they wouldn't combine any further. It's only because the radicals match that you can combine the beginning coefficients. Okay, so they also ask you to simplify these pretty involved radicals and some numbers and some letters. So I'm gonna show you one way to do it. And then I'm gonna talk about a shortcut. So some people like one way, some people like the other. So that's why I kind of wanna do it both. So we're gonna look at how these numbers break down. Now 54, to get this, you can think about its factors. You can do a factor tree, whatever. This is, there are four X's. And if this number was 100, I definitely wouldn't do this method, but I wanted to show it to you first, and then we'll talk about the shortcut method. And there are seven Y's. Because it's a cube root, it's looking for three of the same thing. So I'm gonna start grouping things by threes. There's three, there's three, there's three. So everything that I was able to group as a pair of threes, or a set of threes, is gonna to come to the front. So that meant the three came, the X came and two Y's came to the front. What did it leave behind? This two, this X, and this Y. So now the only thing left to do is, well, Y times Y could be rewritten as a Y squared. So that's the long way to do it. So talk about, real quickly to talk about, the short way to do this is thinking about Number-wise, it doesn't work to do this. Numbers, go ahead and break them into their pieces, find the threes, and do it the other, do it that way. So we know there's a three going to come out from the numbers, and there's a two going to be left inside. Now, the shortcut way for the exponents is you look at how many times does three go into four for the x's? Well, it goes one time, and it has a remainder of one. How many times does three go into seven for the y's? Well, it goes two times and it has remainder of one. So if you have something that has huge numbers like 100, 121, whatever, you don't wanna be writing out that many x's and y's. So you wanna do it with the shortcut method. How, much, how many times does it go evenly? What's its remainder? You get stuck, try writing it out. All right, so radicals are also really nice where they allow us to break things up if it would make our life easier. So since this is a fraction, 16 doesn't reduce by 25. But if I were to break it into pieces, I would have a square root of 16 over the square root of 25, and then I could simplify each one. So if this reduced, I would reduce it first, and then I would break it up into separate radicals. 
just like a while ago when we had um, come back. We had a radical where it was like square root of eight. Oh, why aren't you letting me write? If it was say square root of eight, we could rewrite that as square root of four times square root of two. So radicals allow you to do this with multiplication and with division to kind of simplify your life and do it smaller pieces at a time. All right, so multiplying with radicals is no different really than doing it with just whole numbers or with letters. It's just thinking about where the numbers go inside the radical or outside the radical. So if you're inside the radical and you multiply by somebody who's inside the radical, you can combine forces. But if you're outside the radical and you get multiplied by somebody who's in the radical, you're, if you're outside the radical, you don't wanna go back inside, you're staying outside. So when you look at this one, we're going to distribute like we always do. But when I took a square root of two times a six, six didn't have a radical. So it did not want to go back inside. So it's going to stay out front, kind of like just visiting. But when I took that square root of two times a square root of two, since they're both inside of a square root, they can get together and combine forces. Now, of course, since I always have to simplify whether it's fractions or radicals or whatever, I look at these guys and say, can I simplify? Well, square root of two, no. But square root of four, oh, you're a perfect square, so I can simplify you. So go ahead and distribute like you're always used to doing. Just remember, if you one is inside and one is not, one is going to stay outside then. If they're both inside the radical, you can multiply them together and combine and maybe simplify. How are we doing? Okay, we're getting close to the end. So let me, this one is the same, but it's got a bunch more radicals. So I wanted to show you just one more time. So we're gonna distribute, but you notice here the square root of two and the eight X are both inside. So they can get multiplied together. The numbers then allow me to simplify where the two couldn't and the eight didn't come out evenly, their product comes out evenly. And I was able to take square root two times the square root two and get a square root four. So I can break it apart. This would be square root of 16 times the square root of X. I can simplify the square root of 16 and leave that X inside. Square root of four simplifies to a two. Okay, so this one, I think, how many, let me check real quick. Uh, is that the last? I'm going to see how many slides there are real quickly. I think there's this one, and I think then there's the applications. Come on. Oh, did, okay. Oops. Okay, so this one we're solving. So we're trying to get a value for X, but a bunch of it is hidden inside this square root. It's really protected. So I know that the opposite of the square root is to square something. So as long as I do the same thing to both sides, I know it's legitimate. So I can square both sides, square the X, square the square root. That means this square root and this square, since they're inverses of each other, they will disappear. And then it leaves me something that I can deal with. And since I'm solving, I brought it all to one side, got it equal to zero. And now I can factor or use the quadratic on it. This one factors nicely. So I think I did it with factoring. And we know for solving with factors, we just set them both equal to zero, solve them. But because I did something so powerful, like squaring both sides, sometimes it hides the fact that one of these answers does not work in the original. So you always need to check them back into the original. Plug the seven in everywhere you see an X. Let's see if it works. I get seven equals square root 49, which is seven. Okay, the seven's a good answer. Do the same thing with the negative two. But when you do this, you see negative two equals the square root of four. Well, square root of four is a positive two. So negative two does not equal positive two. So this answer fails. It's a bogus answer. So only the seven will work in this particular problem. 
And you always need to check your answers if you're doing something like square rooting both sides or squaring both sides, because it's such a powerful operation. And I'm sorry I'm having to rush a little bit, but I will send you guys this video as soon as it processes. Maybe that'll help too. Okay, so the next thing, rationalizing. This one's fairly short and sweet. Those guys in the togas, again, decided they didn't like square roots on the bottom. So all you do is multiply top and bottom by whatever's in the square root. And that gives you a perfect square on bottom because this will give us a square root of 25 which we know will pop out to the whole number five. So rationalizing is not so bad. The only thing you do need to check and watch, in this case, there's nothing that reduces, but if there was a, say, a 10 on top, you need to go ahead and reduce the 10 with the five that's on bottom. You will never reduce anything with what's left inside this square root. It's gonna sit there by itself. All right, um, bird problem. We know the bird problem's there, right? At this point, you saw it on the test and you're gonna see it on the final. They're gonna give you a number to plug in and you're gonna find the cube root of 216. If you don't recognize it off the top, go do the factor tree. You know, you put a six in, let's divide a six back out, see what you get. Oh, 36, which divides into two more sixes. So cube roots are looking for three of a kind. So there are three sixes on the inside. So there you go. So it's not so bad if you remember how many you're looking for and what you multiplied by, because the others kind of have to match. All right, last, I think the last two here. You guys dealt with good old Pythagoras and right triangles. You did probably ladders and stuff like that. So the important part to remember is the hypotenuse is the long side. It's the side across from this right angle that's here. So in this case, they gave me the long side, which is a 13, and they gave me one of the other sides, which means I don't know one side, and I can call it A or B. They're both the two legs. I just plug in what they gave me, square each one individually, now I'm trying to solve for the B, so that means I need to get it by itself. So the 144 has to go to the other side. And that leaves me with B squared equals 25. So all I have to do is take the square root of both sides to get to B. And I don't want the negative, even though usually when we take the square root, it gives us a plus or a minus, because it's a length cannot be negative. We can't walk a negative distance. So that's all they're asking me to do. Keep in mind this C, is always the long side or the hypotenuse. It makes a difference where you substitute the numbers. All right, I think this is the last one. So I think this is important because they like this problem and so many people mess it up. So I want to show you how simple it is if you think about the picture and what you're being given. So this is a cube. Cubes are special because every side is the same. They told us the length of every side. You do need to know the volume of a cube formula, which is that good old length times width times height. You're just going to multiply them together. And this is where that trick of regrouping a little bit, put your three threes together, put your three A's together, your B's together, and your C's together. And I think that will help you to see that there were 27, but there were three of the A's, three of the B's, three of the C's. You won't, you don't know how many times I've seen somebody give 27, but then just put A, B, C. They forgot to cube the A and the B and the C that goes with those threes. So thinking about it, writing it like this, maybe regrouping it, that helps. You don't have to, it just helps me visually remember, oh yeah, there's three A's here, there's three B's, there's three C's, and I need to multiply those too because they're going to have all the different variations. You know, they may have three, A cubed, B cubed, C cubed. They may have 27, A, B, C. So watch them. They're tricky when they do these multiple choice. Okay, so um, it's six o'clock. So I'll go, that's the end of what I have kind of together for you. I don't mind staying and answering questions if you guys have questions, or we still have another hour in the learning commons if you want to go and sign in for tutoring. Um, but I do thank you for coming, and I really hope you do well on your test, 
And I hope you found this valuable. Thank you for your time, Ms. Mays. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Take care. Now, you guys, do you guys want this video or are you good? Yes, yes, please. Definitely. Okay. All right. all right, and Eric right. signed in, Brianna. Okay, I got all your. As soon as I get it back from Zoom, I will send it mm -hmm. to you guys. All right, all right thank, thank you so much. All right, take care. All right, thanks, bye.